Okay, hopefully everyone is being seated. We will now conduct the humorous speech contest, but before we get started, I think you all know the drill. If you have one of these devices, of course, if you've turned it on during the break, please put it on silent or vibrate so we don't interrupt our contestants during the contest. This is actually... Is Harlan White in the audience? Harlan White? Harlan White? At this point, I need to disqualify Harlan White from the competition. Thank you, Madam Mary Governor. The Humorous Speech Contest is one of my favorite contests. And let me ask all of you a question. Did you know that Halloween is the biggest adult holiday of the year? Did you all know that? No. It's bigger than Christmas, it's bigger than New Year's, and it's bigger than Valentine's Day. Can you believe that? No. no. I can, and I'll tell you why. You know why? Why? Because it's fun, fun, fun. Woo. And so that's what we're about ready to do is have some fun, fun, fun with the humorous speech contest. So dust off the cobwebs, clear away the great clouds that may be hovering over you, shake off the ghosts and goblins of being, and enjoy the humorous speech contest. So with that said, once the contest has begun, the Sergeant Arms will secure the doors. You, the members of the audience, are asked to refrain from either leaving or entering the room during the contest. And after the contest, please do not leave the room until it's determined that all the ballots have been collected. And again, just a friendly reminder, make sure that all your electronic <coughs> devices are turned off during the contest. So now let me give you the speaking order for the humorous speech contest. Humorous speech contestant number one, Stephen Orr. <coughs> Jerry, you're going to have to tell him that Henry plays is the second thing. I don't think they have Okay, you have on your programs, you have Allison Lee on there, so Stephen is actually the contestant. Oh, okay. So, humor speech contestant number one, Stephen Orr. Humor speech contestant number two, Jeff Talbot. <coughs> humor speech contestant number three, Cayetano Puzan. Cayetano spells C-A-Y-E-T-A-N-O and <coughs> Puzan, P-U-Z-A-N. O-N. O. O-N. Thank you, Cayetano. O-N. Humor speech contestant number four, Martin Streisleck. <coughs> Martin Streisleck. The last name is spelled S T. R Z E L C Z Y K. Contestant number five, Brian Vanderjack. And contestant number six, Greg Kogut. K O G U T. Okay, we will now proceed with the humorous speech contest as before. There will be one minute of silence between the first contestant and between each contestant. Mr. Timekeeper, when I advise you to do so, please signal me when one minute is up. And after all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. We will now begin the humorous speech contest. Stephen Orr. Growing up, Oki. Growing up Oki, Stephen Orr. <laughs> Master Toastmaster, esteemed judges, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. <laughs> During my time in Toastmasters, one thing I've noticed. One surefire way to win over the audience is to tell them about some hardship you've overcome. Now, I think I might be willing to spill my guts. I mean, I could think of what hardship I've overcome. I've lived a pleasant middle class life. A hardship for me is being stuck in a bad cell phone zone. 
<laughs> but then it hit me. I did overcome something. I overcame growing up in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma? It was a fluke that I ended up there in the first place. I was born in New York. But we didn't live there long. All New York really had was Broadway, Times Square, and Central Park. And their quest to find the perfect place to raise a family. My parents moved from there to Hawaii. But Hawaii seemed to be missing something too. All it really had was sand, surf, and beautiful palm trees. We moved on. They scoured the earth. And then, <laughs> Oklahoma, a location that combines all the physical comfort of a blast furnace with the cultural sophistication of a monster truck pole. My parents said, we can quit looking. This is where we want to raise our family. <laughs> if you've ever visited Oklahoma, you might have noticed they have a funny way of talking. Y'all is singular, and all y'all is plural. <laughs> big ol's and all-purpose intensifiers, and that big old trailer, that big old truck. <laughs> Another popular adjective is the word plum, as in, I'm plum tiger, I'm plum tuckered out. <laughs> A phrase such as, it doesn't really matter to me, either option is perfectly acceptable, can be roughly translated to, don't make me no never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and preparing to. Preparing to is more commonly known as fiction to, as in, I'm fixing to go to bed, or I'm fixing to go to store, or I was fixing to go town that big old truck, but I'm plumb tuckered out now. <laughs> when you move to Oklahoma, you quickly learn all four seasons by heart. There's winter, summer, more summer, and football. <laughs> Chicago may be the windy city, but it's got nothing on Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, the 50 mile an hour winds are broken up only by the occasional tornado. <laughs> <laughs> and a tornado siren means it's time to grab a beer and head to the front porch look for that funnel cloud. <laughs> the only thing worse than the wind in Oklahoma is the heat. Oh my God, the heat! No home, you, you break into sweat the second you step outside <coughs> at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> when I was a kid, I know if I smelled burning rubber, it wasn't somebody drag racing. It's my tennis shoe hitting the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> getting into your car in the summer, getting into your car in the summer is fun. Your seatbelt doubles as a branding iron. <laughs> you know, it's so, so miserable. I know kids who went to bed just to <laughs> when I was 17, we moved from a smaller city to the highly sophisticated town of Oklahoma City. It truly was the big city. It could take you 30 seconds to reach your destination, and that's when it's clear across town. Now, Oklahoma City's signature feature at the time, its, it's Sears Tower, if you will, was the cattle stockyards. In a way, it's even more noticeable. The Sears Tower, you can only see if you're looking to the east from the suburbs. The cattle stockyards, you could smell from any direction. <laughs> I went to the University of Oklahoma, also known as the Sooners. Now, Oklahoma's in the middle of the Bible Belt, so they're a very religious people. Many of the religions meet on Sunday, but the most popular religion meets on Saturday. They only meet in the fall, and communion consists of hot dogs and beer. This particular sect is called OU Football, and let me assure you, there is definitely some praying involved. <laughs> OU Football spawns a peculiar form of mass hysteria. On game days, the campus turns into a sea of red and white. I remember one particular individual planned all his vacations on where the away games were. When he got married, he took his wife to the Orange Bowl for their honeymoon. <laughs> now that must be one accommodating wife. Or ex-wife, more likely. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the casual fans. I remember one truly dedicated fan 
And this part is really true. He wore, he wore red and white suspenders over his red and white outfit. He drove a red and white Model T with a horn that played the OU fight song. You know, boomer sooner, boomer sooner. Come on, sing along. Boomer sooner, boomer sooner. He had the OU logo emblazoned on the front of his dentures. Now, this guy's wife must be a real saint. Or ex-wife, more likely. Well, now that you've heard my story, I hope you're all deeply moved by all that I've had to overcome. I've overcome the accent, the blistering heat, an entire wardrobe of red and white. Well, except for this, of course. <laughs> I just couldn't throw it all out. <laughs> but despite the drawbacks, it did have its share of advantages. Whereas you are flip-flops and shorts in the middle of winter, they have more dogs per capita than any other state. And it's the only state based on a musical. <laughs> but whatever else they have going on, they truly have the nicest people in the world there. And really, when it comes right down to it, isn't that what matters the most? As they say in Oklahoma, I reckon I could have done worse. Like Kansas. <laughs> Timer, if I can please have one minute on the clock while the judges mark their ballots. And if we could observe one minute of silence. Jeff Talbot, in over our heads, in over our heads, Jeff Talbot. T.S. Eliot said, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? <laughs> well, a few years ago, my wife Megan and I got in so far over our heads, we found out how tall we both were put together. It all started when we took up mountain biking, a nice little hobby I thought might bring us closer together. And for a while it went great. Riding trails around Illinois and Wisconsin, we really started to get into it. And we got all the gear. Bike shorts and shirts, special shoes to lock our feet into our pedals, and camelback backpacks for constant hydration. <laughs> we were having a blast. But we made a common mistake. We let our heads get too big. We decided we'd outgrown these Midwestern trails. We wanted to know where the real mountain bikers went. And after a little Googling, we discovered they went to Utah. <laughs> so we turned our sights to the west. Thanks to Amazon.com, it arrived the next day in the mail. Mountain biking Utah. <laughs> Greg Bronco. This book quickly became our mountain biking bible. And we poured over it planning our trip. We had no way of knowing we would soon come to curse Greg Bronca, <laughs> even his lovely wife, Trisha, whom he has shown here enjoying a nice glass of wine on some unidentified trail. Nope, we packed up the book and our gear and hit the road. First stop, Moab, mountain biking mecca of the world, home to the best riding surface known to man, Navajo sandstone. At least that's what Greg says. We missed it completely. <laughs> the drive over the Rocky Mountains shredded our brakes. 
we just brushed aside that little setback and <laughs> eagerly attacked our next stop, my Togi Mountain. We set out at dawn with helmets, special shoes, locked and loaded. But as soon as we started up the mountain, we knew we were in trouble. The grade was steeper than anything we'd seen back home, and the terrain was treacherous. We had to stop after just 50 yards and consult with Greg. <laughs> <laughs> just grin and bear it, he said. <laughs> Perseverance is a virtue in this sport. You'll be rewarded at the top with a stunning viewpoint. Well, two hours later, <laughs> Sucking for air, <laughs> hearts pounding like champion thoroughbreds, we reached the top. But at least Greg was right, it was amazing. We just sat down for a while and took it all in. Right. And then we heard the sound of car doors closing. <laughs> and some kids rustled past. <laughs> Quickly as they come, they took off. But rather than dwell on the fact that you could just drive your car up, <laughs> the very spot we spent two hours climbing on two wheels, we pressed on with our ride. Greg said that now we get to roll leisurely across the top of the mountain. We quickly discovered that Greg's version of leisurely was not entirely consistent with ours. <laughs> our legs were on fire, <laughs> and our arms were shot. As we came over a hill, my wife lost her balance, and with her feet locked into her pedals, she went tumbling down the hill. I came up to an indistinguishable mess, <laughs> person and bike. <laughs> Wriggling and squirming, she finally popped up. Boy, was she steaming. She started stomping on her bike and kicking it. And when she was done with the bike, she let me have it. <laughs> Is this fun? She yelled, Is this fun for you? And as I watched her, I was thinking, Actually, this is the most fun I've had <laughs> Instead, I said, Fine, let's just get out of here. And threw the book away in the bushes. That's when we realized we didn't know how to get down. <laughs> so we had to dig the book back out of the book. <coughs> After another couple hours and some more sketchy and misleading directions, we finally reached a spot where Greg said we should plunge headlong down the mountain. <laughs> I can only assume he was advising us to actually jump off the mountain. <laughs> because no man with a conscience could have suggested the trail we took. We had to portage the whole way down over huge boulders. And when we reached the bottom, we had no idea where we were. We had no choice but to pick a direction <coughs> and set out walking. Darkness started to fall. I thought I heard a coyote. <laughs> <laughs> were running dry, but we still didn't panic until we passed the skeletal remains of some huge animal. We started to freak out. Are we going to end up like that thing? Left for dead? In Utah? But just when the situation seemed bleak, we spotted a road in the distance and we made a run for it. We splashed through a small stream. Though we felt the frigid water soak into our bones, nothing could stop us. As we ran up onto the shoulder, I dropped to the ground and kissed the pavement. <laughs> Civilization! At last! A car came around the bend, and some nice people offered us a ride. As we huddled for warmth in the back seat, we started to get the funny feeling we'd seen this family somewhere before. <laughs> Are they the ones from the top of the mountain? Like that? <laughs> I could only nod. They sure were. It might have been easier to take a driving tour of Utah than a mountain biking one, but to this day, we're glad we did it. It did bring us closer together, and we learned we're actually pretty tall. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the things you did do. So sail away from the safe harbor. Catch the trade winds in your sails. Explore, dream, discover. To which I'd only add, pack a good GPS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Can we please have one minute on the clock while the judges mark the ballots? And if we can please observe one minute of silence. Cayetano Cousin. Life with humor is more enjoyable and fun. Life with humor is more enjoyable and fun. Cayetano Cousin. Fellow Toastmasters, distinguished, honored <coughs> guests, my friends, ladies and gentlemen. With all the lovely ladies and gentlemen who are here with us this afternoon, allow me to say thank you for being with us today. Is it true, and this is a question for the ladies, that every woman is like a tea bag? And the answer is yes. Because you don't know, or nobody knows, how strong a woman is until she's dropped in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes, laughters, and humor are gold mines for stories, for fun and for joy. They touch our human emotions, the human spirit, the sentiments and emotions of old and young people alike. And quoting from the book of True Experiences, we see a young boy named Tommy who enters a barber shop. And when the barber saw Tommy coming in, he whispers to his customer, this kid certainly must be the dumbest kid in the whole world. And I'll prove it to you why. John the barber took a dollar, holding it in his left hand, and he also took two quarters holding it on his right hand and motioning Tommy to come over, come closer. He said, Tommy, what would you like to have? And Tommy, who is still smiling, says, took the two quarters, said thank you, and left. And John the barber said, see what I told you? That kid will never change. <laughs> he will never learn. And from the looks of it, John must be overly ecstatic. And also, he felt vindicated 
that what he told was true. Meanwhile, outside the barber shop, the, the customer saw Tommy coming out from the ice cream parlor, and the old man said, Tommy, I have a question for you. Yes, sir? Why is it that you took the two quarters <coughs> instead of the dollar? And Tommy said, licking his ice cream the way as we do it, Sir, when that day comes that I take the dollar, that is the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, how great thou art. We praise thy name and we give you thanks. You made us great because you gave us eyes to see ears to hear, and a tongue to speak. How great it is that we see life and the spectrum of the wonderful world that we live in, green, vibrant, and strong, through the eyes of a young boy or a young girl. We can all relate to this. All of us, except of course the young lady over there, were all young ones. <coughs> you were full of vision, full of dreams and ambition. <coughs> you were ready to climb the highest mountain and conquer the whole thing just for success. Unfortunately, we all have to become older. And as we get older, we change. You have become cantankerous. You have become grand complainers. You are vindictive. You are hard to get along with. <coughs> you are just simply <coughs> impossible. Even your closest relatives are afraid to open up for fear that you might explode like a dynamite. But you have joined the Toastmasters Club. Maybe that is a chance. Who knows? You might become a dynamic public speaker, powerful, eloquent to listen to, bearer of truth, messenger of ideas, and above all, you have joined the greatest organization that can make you an entertainer, a motivator, inspirer of men and women, and also will afford you a chance to make a complete intellectual makeover. Remember Tommy? Tommy was young, smart, and cunning. But I remember little Mickey who said and asked a question, how many women can a man marry? Sixteen. How is that, he said. For better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, <laughs> add them all together, you have sixteen. <laughs> We're all Toastmasters, members of great club, let us make friends. And today, let this be the beginning. Chief Timer, if we can please have one minute on the clock.
for the judges to mark their ballots, and if we can please observe one minute of silence. Martin Streisley, How to Drive an Adult Crazy. How to Drive an Adult Crazy, Martin Streisley. Table Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests. The best way to drive an adult crazy is when you're a little boy. And the best time to do it is when you're on vacation. I'm going to tell you about one particular vacation that stands out in my mind. I must have been seven years old, and we drove 300 miles to northern Wisconsin. And the very first day we show up at this resort, my dad says, Marty, you got an important job. You got to help me get the outboard motor in the boat, and then we are going to go fishing. So, I show up, the boat is docked at this dock, and there's another dock right on behind us. And two little boys are fishing along this dock. My father has to lug this big motor, and my job is to hold this boat steady. My dad gets in the boat, and he's walking gingerly through the boat, and he puts it on the back of the boat, and he locks it down. As he's getting up to leave the boat, that's when things got a little interesting. The two little boys behind me, one little boy says, I think I got a fish. I had to turn around to look, and I moved the boat. <laughs> All of a sudden, I hear a splash, and I go, Dad, there's a big fish. That little boy's got a big fish, and I turn around, and my dad isn't there. <laughs> Up comes the water is my dad. He had fallen off the boat. Yeah. He shows me this really interesting look. And at that point, the little boy next to his brother says, why is that man swimming with his clothes on? <laughs> so that night, I went to bed, and I miraculously got a little older. And my parents told me, Marty, you now have to be responsible for your younger brother. So you got to watch him for the day. I went out with him into, the, into this resort in the forest, and we found a rock to play with. I'm not talking about a little rock. I'm talking about a big rock. I'm talking about a rock that's probably as wide as those doors, and it's like 20 feet straight down, and it's inside a, against a hill, and it slides all the way down to the water. Well, we figured out a way to climb up on that rock, and we lay in our stomachs and slide all the way down to the bottom. And then we'd climb up the hill and do it all over again. It was such a fun time. I had all the little boys and girls in the resort doing the same thing. We just played for hours doing this. When we come marching down to our resort at that end of the day, my parents looked at us and says, Marty, how in the heck could you ruin a new shirt and pants that have holes in your pants and your knees are all scuffed up? When they found out that how I had done that, me and my brother's backsides hurt that night too. <laughs> I went to bed that night and I got up and I was a little older. This time we were going fishing with my dad and I wanted to impress him. So I read this article about musky fishing and how smart these fish are. That particular day, my dad hooks a muskie. He jumps out of the water and you could see it had tiger stripes, just as the article said. He hooked a big one. It was about this big. Just a little guy. At that point, I was 
reading the article in my mind, and I says, Dad, watch out. This fish is smart. He's going to go right for the weeds. And my dad says, come on, he's only a year or two old. Well, the fish dives right into the weeds, and here's my dad with his pole, trying to pull this fish out. As he gets them out, I says, watch it. He's going to take that line and wrap it right around that our pole motor. My father couldn't believe that. No way. Sure enough, that's exactly <laughs> what the fish did. So here's my father with a pole in one hand, moving the motor, and he has to get that fish out from out behind that motor. And just at that second, I says, watch it. He's going to go for those weeds again. And the fish dives right back into those weeds. Finally, my father has got this fish coming up, and he's all set to bring him into the boat. When he pulls him out of the water, the fish just breaks free and falls back into the water. I go to bed that night, and I get up, and I'm a little older. Now I get to go and fish with my uncle. My uncle likes to go bass fishing. For those people who don't know, you go bass fishing at night. You bring a flashlight and you bring your pole. And in this case, my uncle brought his <coughs> brand new plastic fish box. And he told me to lay it in the back, right in the middle of the boat, which I did. We opened it up, and he had all his lures out. And when you go bass fishing, you row with your boat about 20 feet offshore, and you use the flashlight to look where the trees are, and you cast your pole towards the shoreline. Well, we were having a great time. It was at night. You couldn't even see in front of your face until my uncle hooked a big one. He hooked a big tree, and he is pulling and pulling on this tree. It was so high up, you couldn't reach the line. So when he pulls really hard, he loses his balance. He falls over the seat, and he crushes his new fish box, flattens it. On top of that, when he gets up, he has three lures implanted in his lower back side. Now here I am with this flashlight and a pliers, and I have to remove these, or torture him, I'm sorry, remove them from his backside. At that point, the fishing trip was over. As you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually multiple vacations all wrapped up in one. But when you're a little boy, time flies when you are driving adults crazy. <laughs>
And guess what's happening at the dollar store? I find the underwear no problem, size 36. Yes, my stomach continues to get bigger since high school. And guess what? It was a magic moment. She was 36 years old and she had brown hair and brown eyes and she's looking at me and she's smiling. Now I'm a happily married man and I'll never cheat. But you know, to have a 36 year old lady checking you out, that's more than the average man can handle because the ego of a future 56 or 50 year old guy starts to go from here to here. So I go, so she goes, you know, I just want to know for a second here, it's Saturday, are you doing anything tonight? And I'm like, you know, I'm going to play this up a little bit because my ego's got to get a little bigger. I'm going to tell my whole wife about this when we're all done. You guys see you smiling, you know, guys. Okay, I was like, you know, what I'd like to have happen here is, uh, you know, she goes, she takes a look at me and she goes, you know, sir, what i really like to know is, are you free tonight? Because my grandma looks really, really young. <laughs> Ow, the pain. So, you know, I'm like beginning to think, you know, it's like maybe or maybe not, I have a plan tonight, you know, quickly trying to get the heck out of there. You know that little gray box at the uh, dollar store, you type in your little numbers? Since I'm getting old, I couldn't read it. I could not type in the numbers. I could not put my pen in. So ladies and gentlemen, I had a little problem, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna hop in my car, and I'm gonna go home right away, get my glasses, come right back, and type my pin in. Pinning a hasty do as fast as I could, on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was in high school, I was a speed demon. I, was, I learned how to handle those chords as fast as I could possibly have learned in physics class. It was a beautiful thing. And here I am traveling down 50, 70 Fifth Street in Downers Grove, going about 135 miles an hour, and guess what I found? A red light camera. Who here has ever seen a red light camera? Oh yeah. oh yeah. And you know what's really cool about those? They take three pictures of you, ladies and gentlemen. The first picture they take is, is when you first walk into the intersection on your car. And the reason they will first take that picture is to make sure that you actually are crossing in when it's red. And then they take a picture of you in the middle when it's yellow or red just to make darn sure you're actually there. And then the last one, no one could ever actually figure out the third one. Why did they take three pictures? Well, I know, because civil servants get bored. They want to see the driver going, oh my god, I just got a red ticket, ah! So what I decided to do was, uh, you know, with the civil servants, they, they have another situation now, they're sitting there with the, this extra the picture that they're not quite sure what to do with. And so, you know, they, they sat around for a while, they're also, you know, they're more mature also, and they decided what to do with these pictures. They now send them back to the people that were in the intersection, they can experience that third picture moment just one more time. So you, ladies and gentlemen, can experience one of those pictures one last time. So, what, I, what happened also is, uh, finally I got home. It was a sad time, ladies and gentlemen, because now I was an empty nester, there's no one there anymore. Just myself and my wife. And I took a look at the dozen empty glasses of coffee laying around the house. And I used to blame all those on the kids because, you know, I knew it couldn't be me leaving those dozen empty cups of coffee around the house. But you know what? When the kids both went out to college, I found out, no, it was actually me. The next thing I found out, ladies and gentlemen, is, you know that little cap of toothpaste? <laughs> Me. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, you know that seat down thing, the battle, the constant battle between married couples that is seated up or down? Kids. Yes. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to leave you with a summary of this. First off, right now, if you go to the dollar store in Donner's Grove, there's a size, size 36 pair of underwear sitting on the counter, or waiting for somebody to find them someday. But you know what? I am never going back. Do you know why? I am scared of that grandma sitting there waiting for me. <laughs> She's going to be sitting there with her shopping cart on aisle three, just waiting to track me down and see if I'm really single or probably just pretending. And the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to leave you with is I fully expect to be in Toastmasters for around 10 years. And does anybody want to take a guess if I'm going to be in the dollar store for 10 years from now? Depends underwear. I'm trying to get that at a good sale too. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say thank you very much for your good time and have a nice rest of your evening. Bye.
Thank you, Brian. So, Chief Timer, can I please have one minute on the clock? While well, the judges mark their ballot, and please observe one minute of silence. Greg Kogan, the power of a positive giggling. The power of a positive giggling, Greg Kogan. The power of a positive giggling cannot be exaggerated. Your giggling, Kyle, may well determine the course of your life. It can have you singing like Elvis, dancing like Patrick Swayze, <laughs> or boxing like Muhammad Ali. What am I talking about? <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, by the time I'm finished with you, you will all feel as passionately about the gig line as I do. As passionately as Charlie Sheen feels about his recreational indulgences. As passionately as John McEnroe feels about a foul call. As passionately as that infomercial guy does on television. You know the guy I'm talking about. <laughs> the gig line. And yes, it is a military term. Is defined as the straight line formed by your shirt edge, your belt buckle, and your trouser fly. Those of us who attended military school know all too well the power accruing from a positively aligned and well-coordinated gig line, and are painfully aware of the consequences of failing to keep our gig line straight. You, mister, what do you think you're doing with that gig line? Drop and give me 20. You, mister, you call that a gig line? My grandmother has a sharper gig line than that, and she's been in her grave for five years. <laughs> the gig line, you see, is a very powerful impact, far beyond the sum of its parts. The image of a well-coordinated and positively aligned gig line conveys the very essence of supreme self-confidence. Picture Michael Douglas in the movie Wall Street. A sloppy gig line, on the other hand, conveys, conveys precisely the opposite image. Think of Rex Grossman on one of his regular football game performances. <laughs> <laughs> Let me illustrate further with some noteworthy examples. Now, we're fairly certain the gig line was not in existence in ancient Rome, and that could explain how Julius Caesar met with such a bad end. <laughs> Perhaps, had he been equipped with a sharp gig line, and not a designer toga. <laughs> he would have survived the eyes of March and gone on to realize greater military and political successes. We will never know. But something you can know for a moral certainty is the next time you tune in to watch your favorite episode of The Celebrity Apprentice, <laughs> take a close look at that image on your high-definition television set, and you'll see that Donald Trump never ventures out of his Manhattan offices unless he is equipped with a perfectly aligned and impeccable gig line, which, unlike his hair, we know is real. <laughs> Consider for a moment the case of Napoleon. He was quite the general, but things ended badly for him in the field. 
remember your history. Napoleon had some digestive issues which forced him to keep his hand inside his shirt edge to quell his queasy stomach, <clears throat> thus misaligning his gig line. <laughs> if he'd only had some probiotics, <laughs> he would have maintained his pristine gig line and we would all be living under a vastly different geopolitical landscape today, quite possibly still wearing the side-by-side -side bicorn hat. <laughs> Viva la true gig line! Then there was the case of General George Armstrong Custer. Now this fellow took so much time cultivating his hair that he totally neglected his gig line. And this Chief Sitting Bull said, goofy yellow hair man who neglect gig line, lose scalp. <laughs> but think about it folks. Have you known anybody who's ever had an impact on history who has not worn a sharp gig line? <laughs> Have you? I can think of two. Lady Godiva and Superman. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not going to say anything about Lady Godiva. <clears throat> but Superman wore his underpants outside of his clothes. <laughs> Quite possibly, if you were to look beneath the costume, I think you would have found the full Monty. <laughs> Not the full Monty, what are you thinking about? Have you been paying attention? The straight gig line, come on folks. <clears throat> so there you have it. Folks, you now have an appreciation for the mystique of the gig line. Imagine what a straight gig line can do for you. You can have Jay Cutler with a smile on his face. You can climb Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. You can have Sarah Palin talking sense. <laughs> you could balance the federal budget. You could understand what Ozzie Guillen says. <laughs> the Cubs could win the World Series. Oh, wait a minute. That's one, that one's even beyond the power of the gig line. Still, the next time you march your troops off to battle, real or imagined, don't look to the heavens for assistance. It isn't about whether the moon is in the seventh house or Jupiter aligns with Mars. No, Cheryl, the key to your destiny lies much closer to home. Shirt edge, belt buckle, trouser fly. How straight is your gig line? Mr. Tosin. <laughs>
Mr. Toastmaster, we have all the ballots. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. Okay, while the judges and the ballot counter is outside of the room tallying up the, the ballots, how about we get to know our contestants? First, we'll interview the speech evaluation contestants, Mr. Chief Timer, if I could please have about a minute on the clock for each contestant for a brief interview. If I could please call up all the speech evaluation contestants. Barbara. Hello. Nice job. Thank you. Tell us what club you're representing. I represent representing town criers. Okay. And how long have you been a Toastmaster? About eight years. About eight years. Okay. And at this point, what's your educational level? I went a year and a half to high school. <laughs> and Toastmasters. Toastmasters. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, 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 no. No, I, I have not achieved anything but my first book, and I did that in six months. Your CC? Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> what, what prompted you to get into the evaluation contest? I got my arm twisted by Frank. So in other words, you were voluntold by Frank. Oh, yes. That's a new term I've learned in Toastmasters. When you don't willingly volunteer, they just kind of volunteer. He did. He did. Okay. Okay. What, in your eight years that you've been in Toastmasters, what's been the biggest learning for you? Uh, to re try to remember and get my brain active because I, I'm 80, I'll be 82. Wow. All right. Six years ago, started with Alzheimer's, and she's four years younger than me, so I thought I better start getting some clicking sounds. <laughs> well, I think it's all working for you. Barbara, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation for participating in the evaluation contest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sarah, come on down. What club are you representing? Spiritually speaking. Okay, and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Since 2008. And your educational level? In Toastmasters. In Toastmasters. Competent yes. communicator. Competent communicator. So, and how long did you take to get your CC? I think about, I think it was about a year. About a year? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, so pretty maybe much, 13 months. Right. So, you're pretty much kind of speaking in every other meeting? Yeah. More or less? Something like that. Oh, great. Or actually, probably speaking every other meeting, long draws, speaking every meeting, a little bit of off and on. Okay. Like and what originally brought you to Toastmasters? I had heard that it was a great organization by someone whom I really respect. And I know that we all need to improve our communication skills, and I wanted to take mine to the next level. Great. 
would like to present you with this certificate of participation for participating in evaluation contest. Thank you so much. <laughs> Schroeder. Same question, sir. What club are you PX representing? The Masters for about ten years, my friend. And, and I know, and I know, and, and I know what club you belong to. I know you know that. Yes, I know which one. It's the Axie Masters, uh, right down the street on 88. Great bunch of people and a wonderful club. Okay. And what originally brought you to Toastmasters? You know, just what happened today. I've never brought my camera out to a uh, to a contest before. And I tell all the people in our club to come out to these contests, and unfortunately not enough people other than dignitaries come out. But I brought my daughter today specifically to see that gentleman, and that was one of the funniest speeches I had seen in a primary contest. Uh, he beat our club representative, and I just wish they would have had a chance to entertain everybody today because that was just amazing. That's terrific. And Bruce, out of your 10 years, because I don't get a chance to talk to you in contest, out of your 10 years in Toastmasters, what's been kind of the biggest uh, how moment or kind of biggest learning for you? The biggest learning for me was I, I came to a contest about 10 years ago and I saw Connor Kaneen who was in the audience or was in the audience earlier today and Johnny Campbell. And when I saw those two people speaking, I said I want to be like them. Mm -hmm. okay. well, I think you certainly achieved at that level. Bruce, I'd like to present you this certificate of participation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sir, I think you actually have lines. Oh, I do. I don't need to steal it. Sure, okay. sure, sure. And here, let me give you the correct one. The sleight of hand here. Okay, Blaine, same question, sir. What club you're representing? And Windy City Professional Speakers. Okay. And how long have you been in Toastmasters? About 10 years. Actually, 20. Oh. But I was off for a while. So, <laughs> yeah. so you kind of went on hiatus and then you got reinstated. Yeah. Okay. And let everybody know, um, because those of us that are kind of advanced clubs, let them know how Windy City Professional Speakers differs from the regular clubs. The focus is on evaluation. So we don't do table topics. Um, we don't do evaluations like regular club evaluations. So we do longer speeches and much longer evaluations that are the whole group evaluating the presenter as opposed to one person. And out of your total time in Toastmasters, Blaine, what would you say has been your biggest learning in Toastmasters? What's been your kind of biggest aha moment? Uh, you never get there. I mean, you never, you never get to this place that you're kind of thinking that you're going to get to. So it's constant learning, constant improvement. Okay, so it's kind of like the Japanese word kaizen, constant and never ending proof. Okay. Well, we'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Thank you so far. Thank you, Jerry. Very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Same question, Patrick. What club are you representing? Platinum Toastmasters and Liar. <laughs> and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Almost one and a half years. And how did you come to Toastmasters? I heard someone uh, I know that told me about uh, Toastmasters are very uh, uh, important for building leadership skills and communication skills, so that's why. Okay. Terrific. And what's your educational level right now in Toastmasters? I will be doing speech number six in one week. Okay, terrific. Okay. Okay. Your CC right now. Okay, starting on number six. What have you thought about? Kind of what your overall goal is for Toastmasters at this point? Um, I haven't really thought about long term, but you know, at least complete my CC and CL. So okay. CL, I'm about halfway. Well, stay on track for that and keep up the momentum. Yeah. Thank so you. we'd like to thank you for participating in the evaluation contest. Thank you so much. Great job. <laughs> and Mr. Mike Vane. Oh, nice. What club you're representing? So I represent Naperville Toastmasters Club, and we actually have quite a few from the club here. I've been in Toastmasters just a little bit over a year, and uh, someone else mentioned Connor Kaneen. He was actually at the first meeting that I was at, uh, it, speaking, I think, getting ready for this contest, and I just thought, wow, uh, that's, uh, I want to be able to be like that. Something inspired to Absolutely. Connor's, Connor's terrific. So what originally brought you to Toastmasters? 
It's one of those things I just kept hearing other people kind of talk about it, mention it, and I thought, you know what, I better go check this out. And that's how I got involved. Okay. Now, you've completed your CC at this point, or? Not yet. So I've completed eight speeches. Okay. My ninth speech will be this next week. So I'm on track there. I'll get it soon. So we're going to see you at the Achievers Breakfast at the conference. That's right. <laughs> Is that fall? Is that fall? No, 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 no. November 12th. I won't be that close. November 12th. <laughs> November 12th. Well, Mike, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation for participating in evaluating our test. Okay, I think that is all of our speech evaluation contestants. So now, what I would like to do is I would like to call up all of our humorous speech contestants to the lecture. Guess what question I'm going to ask you? Naperville Toastmasters, 2051. <laughs> I was in it for about four years, and I took about two years off. I moved, and then I just recently found another club, and I've been in that club around six months. Okay. And what's your Toastmaster educational designation at this point? I am a DTM Gold. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm not a DTM, I'm sorry. A CCM. Can't company communicate well. Okay. Not a DTM. It's got to be. Okay. It's got to be. You've got to be. So what's my goal? Ask it's me that. Yeah, there you go. What's your goal, Stephen? DTM. Okay, correct. <laughs> now, what originally brought you to Toastmasters? Well, I started a new job, and I... I've always been very nervous about getting up in front of groups and speaking, so I remembered back from my youth, my father was in Toastmasters and loved it. And that turned out to be a pretty cool thing because I would uh, send him copies of my speeches and he loved reading them, so that was a, a neat connection that we had. Okay. And what would you say has kind of been your biggest learning at this point? You always have the butterflies, you just got to stomp them out a little bit and get up there. So, terrific. Just... Well, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation for participating in the Hearing Speech Contest. Thank you so much and great job. Toastmaster? <clears throat> um, a little bit over a year. Wow. Okay, terrific job. And what originally brought you to Toastmasters? I just wanted to get more comfortable speaking and um, maybe start doing some speaking uh, for work. Okay, so now have the butterflies started to kind of settle down with you at this point or still a little anxiety? Oh, I always get, get the butterflies, definitely. Yeah. But it's, it's more about managing them and using them to your advantage. Okay. Kind of channeling that energy. What you've been in Toastmasters for years, so what's your educational designation? So I'm working on my CC. Um, I think I've done six or seven speeches. So you're halfway through. Good job. All right. Let's go. <laughs> so you're just been in Toastmasters right now. What's been kind of the biggest learning for you? Actually, John Lee, who's in the audience, mm -hmm. um, gave me didn't give me the tip, but said it at a meeting, which was take a little bit from everybody, you know, just pick up on things that you see and incorporate that into your repertoire. So I've been trying to do that and it's, it's, it's worked pretty well. <coughs> well, I certainly, today with your speech about going to Utah, certainly enlightened us. We did a great job with that. <laughs> so on behalf of the division, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation for participating in I am with the Glendale Heights uh, Toastmasters Club, <coughs> used to be Toastmasters Club, I was at Toastmasters International. Okay. And how long have you been at Toastmasters, Kai Uh October was uh, the birth date of our club, and uh, I was uh, one of the chartered members. Ooh. Okay. So that makes it two years. Two years. Congratulations. <laughs> 
what's your current educational designation in Toastmasters right now? How many speeches have you completed? I finished uh, my CC requirement in six months' time, and I just finished my ten, uh, ten advanced speeches. Terrific. Okay. <laughs> Track, you? Well, uh, I, I, I think uh, being a, a Toastmasters, uh, it is within our opportunity to really advance our cause. And one of the reasons why I joined is that I want to be more confident when I'm facing a very special crowd, intelligent crowd. <laughs> Well, you, you know all these folks are all DCPs. You know what that is? That's a distinguished class of people. Yes. So you're an excellent couple. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank speech contest. Great job and continued success to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Martin, come on down, sir. Well, 156, DuPage Valley Toastmasters. Okay. And how long have you been a Toastmaster? Uh, slightly over 20 years. Wow. Slightly over 20 years. Wow. 20 years. How many contests have you been in? Contests? Yes. Four or five. Four or five. What, do you, what would you say to the folks that are thinking about getting into contests? What would you say to them? Just do it. It's, the experience is, you can't describe what it is. <laughs> So you've had fun, particularly, have you just done humorous, have you done evaluation contests, or? I've done both. You've done both, okay. Terrific. And what would you say to, since you've been in Toastmasters for 20 years, what would you say to the newer Toastmasters in the audience? Well, I would say find a member in your club that's had a lot of experience, uh, and then they can give you all the pointers and give you the confidence you need for public speaking. I was blessed with... Uh, three people, two of which is no longer with the club. Some people might really know him, Ron Adams and Bill Jenkins. Uh, and I also have Jim Burlbach, who's been with our club for almost 50 years now. So those are good experienced people to, to help you. Well, I'm sure he probably, he probably knows uh, Dick Storer. Yeah, I'm sure he who is, you know, I think they have to be the two of the oldest Toastmasters in the district because Dick Storer is coming up on 51 years. So that's pretty incredible. Well, Martin, thank you so much for participating in the contest. Great job. And here's a certificate of participation on behalf of the Southwest Division. Thank you so much. <laughs> Same question, sir. Kickstarters. We are in Downers Grove. We do round robin evaluation. So if you're almost at semi pro level, come to us because we're gentle, but we're firm. Okay. And Brian, how long have you been a Toastmaster? About six years. And out of the six years, how many contests have you been in? I know I've seen you in a few. Well, I'm the, uh, because of all the support I've gotten from the people around me, Humorous is the only one I have not won an award in at the division level. And again, that's because the Humorous keep me, Toastmasters have always taught me what I you know. And the reason I'm here today is that I'm really not a funny guy. I'm from IT. <laughs> That's funny. So the, the very first laugh I got here today, seriously, was one more laugh than I got at Area two years ago. So if I could stand here today, I challenge each and every one of you to get to competing and get up here and start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we can't, we can't, we can't leave empty handed. Thank you for participating, Brian. Thank you. I'm sure you keep mine straight there. And it looks not bad. The last center, it's a little bit off. Okay. What club are you representing? I am a proud me member of the Platinum 4117. Two and a half years, I've got my CL, and I'm about a speech away from my CC. You've got your CL, and you're about half a speech away from your CC? Ten speech for CC. Okay. So, we're going to see you at the Chief's breakfast, right? Hopefully so. We'll be right there with Darren Corbett. Great. Out of the time that you've been in Toastmasters, what would you say 
that's kind of been your biggest learning? Well, Connor Kaneen, Rick Eckstein, Sarah, all members of my club, watching those guys up there, tremendous learning example for me. So it's, it's a learning experience every day. So it's constantly kind of growing yeah. and evolving each every time, time each time you do. What would you say to the folks, again, for those who have perhaps not competed before and entered a contest? Is this your first one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sarah liked my speech, so she asked me to compete. <laughs> this is my speech number two. You get mine, you know, organize, okay. keep working. Just do it, you know. It's like the fellow who was here up earlier. Just do it. Get up there. And the more experience, the more you learn. Well, you did a terrific job. Well, Greg, on behalf of the Southwest Division, I'd like to present you this terrific participation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great job. Okay, do we have all our folks back in the room yet? You have all the results. Okay. Let me at this time call up our Southwest Division Governor, Donna Weston. Mm -hmm. Call up Michelle Cable, our Lieutenant Governor of Marketing. <laughs> and also, Ellen, come on up.
Is anybody going to see him? What's his name? I will. What's his name? Hugh Dunbar. Dunbar. Okay. Save my day. Thank you. And our chief ballot counter, Sherry Jewell. Quick announcement, if you don't mind. Sure. Contest should be up and online by Monday. So if any of you guys need to uh, see yourself before the division, it's already been with the Northwest. I'll send a link to your division governor who will be able to share with all the clubs. Thank you. Thank you. Couple quick things. Any club wants to sponsor the speech of that on October 29th? We also have some flyers up here for that and for fall conference. And with that, thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great time. Have a great rest of the weekend.